Garcia, and I'm a professor in the history department here of European history, and I'm also the director of the Lincoln European Institute, uh, which is a, a sponsor of this, uh, together with colleagues uh, in the School of Journalism. And the question was asked, well, why is the European Institute involved in this? And I think at a time of scarce resources, it's worth responding to that, as we like to respond to my board, which supports us. And the, the idea is that you know, we're very much interested in global hegemonies and how they change. And we, I personally have been very much interested in how America has exercised its um, uh, cultural hegemony. And in the framework of the European Institute, to take it a step further, we've been very, very interested in how uh, these kinds of powers are exercised across the Atlantic. And, and more particularly how Europe itself uh, you know, operates globally and how that, uh, often these operations intersect with the Americans. So uh, the uh, panel we have tonight, which has been organized by uh, our colleague uh, Catherine Brown, uh, who will be presenting, uh, is, is a sort of step toward giving this our best uh, effort uh, in, in organizing a series that is bringing together, uh, in the case of the college, historians also uh, uh, works with the uh, Institute of Cultural Diplomacy in soft power in uh, California with <coughs> practitioners uh, and with an audience of these historians but also with journalists uh, and who are very, very active also in the administration uh, of cultural diplomacy. So with that, Catherine, I'm going to introduce you. Uh, Catherine uh, teaches here but is also uh, getting her finishing her degree right, at the uh, School of Journalism. Well, um, we're thrilled to have four very distinguished um, guests to discuss the media's past, current, future role in state-sponsored broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And first, our speaker, Nicholas Paul, who's Professor of Public Diplomacy and Director of the Master's Program in Public Diplomacy at the University of Southern California. He previously was a lecturer in American History at the University of Birmingham and a Professor of American History at the University of Leicester. He's authored several books that relate to our discussion today, some of which include The Cold War and the United States Information Agency, American Propaganda and Public Diplomacy, another book, The Projecting Empire, Imperialism and Popular Cinema, and the forthcoming book, Projecting Tomorrow, Science Fiction and Popular Cinema. Or is that out? No, that's out in, that's out in February. Yeah, that's but right. I don't know if that's, I don't know if it relates to this. Okay. Unless people really want to know what happened during the making of Robocop, which I think is terribly exciting. You're welcome, Professor Paul. Thank you. Um, next, our, one of our panelists, David Enzor, who's the director of Voice of America. Uh, there, he oversees a worldwide multimedia operation that broadcasts in 43 languages through radio, television, robot, and the internet. And most recently, he served as the Director of Communications and Public Diplomacy at the American Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. And he's also had an extensive career in journalism and communications from 1975 to 1980. He reported for National Public Radio, where he covered the White House, foreign policy and defense issues. And then from 1980 to 1998, he was a television correspondent for ABC News. And from 1998 to 2006, he was CNN's uh, Chief National Security Correspondent. Um, and Rajesh Mukundani, who is a Los Angeles-based correspondent for the British Broadcasting Corporation. There, he reports for a variety of BBC News platforms, including BBC World News, BBC World News America, and BBC Radio. And before moving to California, he was a Washington correspondent for BBC. And uh, finally, Emmanuel St. Martin, who has been the New York correspondent for France 24 since it began <coughs> Uh, before that, he was a print journalist, mainly with the weekly Le Point, and he's also the author of several books, including the Ar um, French Arrogance, <laughs> in English, about French foreign policy, and he's also the founder of a French-speaking web magazine called French Morning. And we're honored to have you all with us this evening. Uh, we'll first hear from Professor Cole, and then uh, before moving on to a panel discussion. Thanks, Kevin. No. Um, uh, what, what I want to do to uh, begin with is to uh, try and uh, set some uh, sort of basic frame of reference explaining uh, wh where I see international broadcasting and public diplomacy uh, fitting together and because we're a, you know, a diverse group you might not be used to thinking about 
public diplomacy as a uh, as, as a, um, a, a thing at all. Um, so I'll, I'll say something about what I think public diplomacy is, and then I want to give you a potted history of international broadcasting before setting up something of the new terrain on which international broadcasting now operates, and then um, maybe outlining some of the responses of international broadcasting to uh, this terrain. And I think that you'll see that the responses and the challenges of the new terrain will generate uh, questions uh, for, for the, the, the panel. And um, my theme really is, uh, I hope I can tease out as I go, something of the tension within public, within international broadcasting, between the policy needs of public diplomacy and the uh, ethical requirements of the practice of, um, of journalism. And I think one of the things that's really, reasons it's really exciting to be talking about this subject in uh, uh, Colombia is because of the role of the Colombia Journalism Program uh, as a, particularly the uh, Columbia um, uh, Journalism Review as being a, um, a sort of a, a beacon uh, of, of good practice. And a, a number of moments in VOA's history when they ran into problems, those problems were aired in the, uh, uh, the journalism review here, and so there's sort of been a certain symbiosis. Uh, so first of all, what is public diplomacy? Well, I define public diplomacy like this. I'd say, well, first of all, you've got to look at what traditional diplomacy is. And that, as I see, is simply an actor's attempt, international actor's attempt, to manage the international environment, but through the process of engaging with a foreign actor. So in the past, it's been you know, heads of state uh, meeting one another, uh, and, and professional diplomat in contact with professional diplomat, government to government communication. Public diplomacy is different. It's still trying to manage the international environment, uh, but it has a particular set of tools, the tools of engagement with a foreign public. And it stands to reason one of the major ways in which a government can communicate with the public is through uh, broadcasting. So when uh, an internet, when uh, a government sponsors a, a broadcaster, uh, that is both a form of international broadcasting and also a form of public diplomacy. But public diplomacy is a relatively new term. Uh, it, it forms the meaning that it has today of being uh, foreign policy through engagement with the foreign public only about 1965. But beneath that term, we have five practices that I see as being pretty much as old as um, a statecraft. And it's to those five practices that are, that are now turned. The first practice, the first way in which an international actor should engage with a, a foreign public is by listening to that public. And uh, you know, ancient um, uh, uh, philosophers of statecraft, you know, or like, like Sun Tzu and others, uh, recommend uh, listening, recommend studying the people you're trying to um, uh, engage with. The second form is advocacy, going out and explaining yourself. Uh, this is something that was done uh, in uh, ancient Greece, so it's, it's not a new uh, form of diplomacy at all. Uh, third form, uh, cultural diplomacy, facilitating the export of your culture. This is something the Romans did. Byzantines did, this is an image of uh, St. Cyril, who was subsidized by the Byzantine emperor to spread Orthodox Christianity in what's now um, uh, East, Eastern Europe. Exchanges, exchange diplomacy, in, uh, uh, engaging the foreign public by exchanging with, those, with that public. That's also an ancient thing, part of uh, um, tribal practices in Northern Europe and in other places in the world too. And finally, international broadcasting. This has been done through electronic media, but I would argue can be mapped back and traced back to certain previous practices of states seeking to facilitate the spread of news rather than opinion about uh, their country to uh, their neighbors. The United States came along in 1965 and imposed this one-term public diplomacy on these five practices. The reason they imposed the term was because of a bureaucracy 
Uh, they thought it would be a good idea to pull them together to establish the authority of the agency, the United States Information Agency, which existed at that time to conduct uh, public diplomacy. Um, but the term is not necessarily a good thing because you know, the truth is that each of these elements is quite distinct and does best if allowed a certain degree of independence. In fact, most countries uh, have completely separate agencies to conduct each of these functions. It's only now in the United States which thinks it's a great idea to, to try and uh, pull them all together. And the result is that often the five elements try and pull apart. And as a historian, uh, it's been great for me because I get to write about all the, the, you know, the terrible strain when the people who are you know, in advocacy try and pull international broadcasting into line and try and get them to uh, you know, project messages and, uh, uh, um, and uh, compromise on the news and, uh, 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 and so forth. Uh, but I think it's horrible to live through. Um, and uh, counterproductive to uh, the ends of foreign policy. But a lot of the history of public diplomacy is uh, conflict between these different uh, elements. International broadcasting comes from a number of quite different uh, places. There's the desire of the nation state to project its image, uh, a long term concern of the state. And you can go back to people like. Uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, who would publish a newsletter around 1100, mainly about why he didn't like the Pope at that particular month. And this would be translated and supplied to the royal courts all around uh, Europe. There's uh, interest in transmission of news, always important to new regimes. You can see how the Dutch uh, regime, uh, of William the Silent, which comes to power you know, around uh, 1600, pays a lot of attention to getting uh, news of, of things that are happening in the Netherlands out of their perspective is understood. And finally, in the 20th century, it became necessary for the um, uh, old empires of Europe to connect to their own citizens uh, living overseas. Uh, so a number of the um, European countries establish uh, language services uh, the, net, the Dutch lead the way, Radio Netherlands broadcasts to its uh, Dutch citizens in, the, um, uh, in uh, East Asia. Um, and uh, this idea of connecting to expats creates international, um, uh, sort of, uh, international broadcasting. And finally, you have a transmission of, uh, of culture, using radio to um, spread uh, cultural ideas around the world uh, and elements in your culture. We go through a number of uh, distinct phases in the history of international broadcasting. It begins with a sort of competitive national projection, different nations setting up uh, radio stations to uh, impress their ideas, their perspective on the world. Radio Moscow uh, in the early days was one of the most uh, prolific. In World War II, Britain develops a new approach, seeking to make uh, balanced news, credible news, into a virtue and part of the, uh, the uh, communication brand, if you like, of um, the, the country. And Britain becomes a mentor when the United States enters World War II, uh, becomes a mentor to American international broadcasting, assisting in the creation of Voice of America, which adds its own spin, not only um, pledging itself to give uh, balanced news, whether the news is good or bad, but also adding a cultural uh, dimension. So uh, having, from the beginning, both a, a, a sort of a news diplomacy view, uh, value, but also a cultural diplomacy value, um, using, making great use of uh, American music. Uh, international broadcasting, or Western international broadcasting, was maintained in the Cold War. And one of the best known stories is the way in which the VOA broadcaster, Willis Conover, uh, who broadcast jazz music, was immensely popular in, in Eastern Europe, uh, really across a 40-year uh, period. But in the US, a new uh, 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 genre of international broadcasting emerged, not a national projection broadcasting, but what was called a surrogate broadcasting. And the idea of surrogate broadcasting is that a concerned country would establish 
a surrogate for a media organization in the country they wish to engage with. Uh, they would staff it with exiles and would seek to provide news programming of, of interest or political value to that target country. And the key example of this would be the creation of uh, Radio, the Radio Free Europe uh, lineup, where you had exiles broadcasting uh, in the languages of uh, the target um, countries. Uh, this was much, much more political in its origins than Voice of America. Uh, the surrogate broadcasters were established originally by the CIA. Some of the people who were the original broadcasters were refugees of decidedly dodgy political backgrounds uh, who were of more value uh, politically than they were uh, uh, as, as broadcasters. But the great advantage for VOA was that with the CIA having its own radio station to play with, uh, VOA got to evolve into the good cop, and it became possible for VOA to emulate uh, what it saw as the BBC's uh, credibility values, though the BBC had, has a few scrapes in its history. And, and so the VOA is free to pursue uh, a, a, a charter obligation to be uh, balanced in its presentation of the news, and uh, that's been an incredibly important part of its history. The Western broadcasters. Uh, played an immense part in the 1980s as um, uh, channels for communicating, for sustaining um, the uh, reform uh, community, reformist community in Eastern Europe. Uh, figures are as high as 80% of people in Poland listening to Western broadcasters uh, at, at least once a week. It really became part of people's lives. Uh, and uh, had, I think, an immense impact on that political change. This is really the, the, um, the, the high watermark of the uh, importance of uh, international broadcasting. But the problem was, when, when the Cold War came to an end, what is the role of international broadcasting? And um, all sorts of questions are asked about it in uh, the countries which have been uh, subsidizing international broadcasting, the governments will say. Well, one of the questions was, why do we need Radio Free Europe when Europe is free? Uh, and each of the, the, the different stations out there had to address these kinds of questions. But broadcasting began to change. A number of new features, there was more uh, emphasis on interactives, more phone-ins, a new kind of relationship with the audience and uh, new kinds of uh, broadcast mechanisms. The stations moved away or supplemented their shortwave broadcasts with uh, use of um, FM, so partnering with affiliates in countries to which they wish to broadcast so that they could be heard uh, on um, domestic channels. Uh, and uh, from the mid-90s, you have the use of online um, resources in various ways. VOA is one of the uh, leads the way um, in, in this. Initially, it's streaming not my actual programs, but making scripts available on what was called the Gopher Protocol. Uh, I'm sure nobody, probably not many of you here are old enough to actually have used Gopher as a, as a web platform, but it was there, and it was quite, actually quite useful. Um, but, you know, maybe the greatest challenge to state uh, international broadcasting ha has been the emergence of uh, commercial, commercially based international broadcasters uh, like CNN moving into the, that space that had, you had required uh, to be a government really to speak in that space in the past. And uh, regional broadcasters like Al Jazeera uh, really began to shake things up. In, I want to spend some time now talking about the new terrain and some of the features I see um, international broadcasting has to face now. First of all, there are many, many more new players in the marketplace. I think you know, just we in this room, if we wanted to, could put together uh, an international broadcasting program using the equipment right here, put it online. The problem would be, would anybody want to listen to it? You know, it's how do you, the question no longer is how do you get information in front of an international audience? It's how do you market that information so that people will actually want to uh, take, take part in it? The barriers to entry 
in international broadcasting are so much lower than they once were, and it's so much easier to get material out. A lot of this is, of course, to do with new technology, but the new technology is creating new directions of communication that are a great challenge for international broadcasting. In the past, international broadcasting worked in a sort of a, vir in a, a virtual, sorry, in a vertical communication uh, model where you know, there were a few great centers of communication power in the world, uh, most significant being Moscow and Washington, and when these centers spoke, everybody around the world listened, and information kind of came directly down from the top to all the people around the bottom of the, of the communication mountains waiting for, uh, to hear what was, what was being said. But communication doesn't work that way anymore. Now we are horizontally oriented, and the information is passed from person to person to person across the horizontal network. The international broadcasters have to compete with many other sources of information and uh, have certain advantages, but they also uh, face disadvantages too. But I think um, this uh, horizontal, the horizontal nature the communication environment is, is a massive uh, challenge. One of the challenges that comes out of this is that it's now possible, given the amazing plurality of information sources in the world, which could include people like you on Facebook, right? it's now possible for you to get all your information from people who are exactly like you. So if you are a 15-year-old girl who likes Justin Bieber, it's possible for you to only get information from other people who are also 15 years old and also like Justin Bieber. And maybe that's not so much of a problem if you have a close loop of 15-year-olds who really like Justin Bieber, though it can be a shock when you realize what they don't know, as the other week in Los Angeles when I was standing next to a 15-year-old girl who really liked Justin Bieber, and she was completely shocked that there were windows in the space shuttle as it went by, because she didn't know people went in the space shuttle. Uh, it was amazed that there'd been such a thing as human space flight. Uh, maybe somebody should have launched Justin Bieber into orbit. But the, you know, the, the problem is um, multiplied when you say, look at uh, uh, one of these uh, closed loops of people who are all co-religionists. And it ceases to be funny when you think of a, a world where uh, it's possible to only get your information from other people who share a particular political idea or a particular uh, religious um, e extreme position. How do you break into those niches, whether they're language niches, community niches, religious niches? Uh, that's a great challenge. And all this has to be done with less resource. One of the great features of international broadcasting is it's getting harder and harder and harder for broadcasters to sell what they're doing to their governments. Uh, broadcasting did an excellent job of presenting itself as a necessity of the Cold War, but it's much harder to sell itself in a post-Cold War um, environment unless you're obviously connected to a project like the uh, War on Terror. I think another problem is that the role of international broadcasting is misunderstood. And maybe the role of public diplomacy is misunderstood. The people who fund it, by and large, are looking for a magic bullet that they can fire at foreign policy problems. They're not looking to uh, do something like, say, build relationships. They're not looking to develop a, uh, a two-way street or create a, uh, something like international understanding, or to have a conversation, or certainly not to learn more about the world. Um, it's all about a one-way projection, and this is not the way that communication works today. And if you want to approach the world in terms of imposing yourself on it, uh, you're not going to get very far. You have to approach it from a point of view of thinking about engagement, thinking about relationships. So this mismatch between what broadcasters now do, how communicators now think, and what senators and congressmen expect, I, I see as a big problem. So international broadcasting's responses have been quite creative. There have been new business models. Uh, the BBC and, um, and, and, uh, and France both responded by uh, creating 
uh, but both responded to the challenge of CNN uh, by creating their own uh, television channels. Uh, and initially, uh, the, uh, France used a, um, a state private model, but I believe that the uh, private sector has been bought out, so it sort of re-launched uh, a uh, state-owned model, whereas the BBC is able to run as a, a BBC World as a commercial uh, operation without financial aid from the British government, as if with, with advertising, and uh, which I think has, has come as a surprise that, that that was um, possible with it, but it certainly allows more to be done. There are new stable mates for international broadcasters in the United States, where you have the international uh, the, the broadcasting board of governors. Under that um, umbrella, you have stations that have a much more overt political agenda than Voice of America, particularly Radio Sawa, uh, which was created in the place of the OA Arabic in the early uh, 2000s. Uh, and Al Hura, America's uh, television channel aimed at the Middle East. You have international broadcasters moving in to development work, uh, actually working with partners in the developing world to build capacity. An example of this is the BBC World Service Trust, which has sought to uh, teach um, broadcasting uh, techniques and uh, to generate reliable research data on media in the developing world. I know that VOA has also been involved with developing uh, journalism uh, in um, different places around the world. And I think that this idea of building capacity as being one of the functions of international broadcasting is a, a very interesting uh, development. All the broadcasters that I know anything about now are placing immense emphasis on partnership not seeing themselves as being the sole uh, providers or one-stop shops, but rather um, being uh, entities that can work with other countries, provide services for, and uh, uh, other broadcasters. I know this is something that, that uh, uh, David's been uh, developing at, at, at uh, VOA. And we see also uh, new modes of consumption. Uh, as international broadcasting has to move away from just being consumed on uh, radio sets to moving into handheld devices, into internet services, and being consumed in the way where people won't necessarily sit and listen to a long stream of a program, but might hear a part of a program, or uh, um, which could be emailed or uh, sent in a, a small, or reworked, or mashed uh, way. And uh, the, um, the key I see here is that international broadcasters are having to learn to work as a, what I would call an information brand. And I think it's like the transition from, if you imagine, a supplier of water who used to have everybody plumbed in and would turn on the tap and water would go along the pipe work and people would, 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 would get water from the tap, like a water utility. Maybe that's how things were originally for the BBC or VOA or Radio France International, that they would have their audience. Now, people are going online and are finding news stories, and the, those news stories might be sourced from international broadcasting sources. There may be a VOA story, a BBC story, or a France 24 story. Whether they read that story, whether they decide to pass it on to the other people in their information network, and whether those people then choose to pass it on, could be based, or is based, on the reputation, the brand associated with that story. So if you see a story that has a strong brand, and, and all three of our speakers come from organizations that have a strong brand, it goes further. So I, I think there's a transition in terms of the way news is passed from moving beyond, you have your tap labeled, BBC World Service and you drink from it to you go to a sort of information store and you see a bottle labeled BBC and you think, well, I'll, I'll drink that, I'll pass it on to somebody else, and you leave on the shelf the bottle uh, either with no name or labeled uh, CCTV9 or, or some broadcaster that you have less, uh, less confidence in. Um, but the question is, 
uh, how do you stay relevant? And I think that international broadcasters have to ask this uh, all the time, have to ask themselves, how do they remain relevant to the audience? How do they stay relevant to the people who are funding them? Um, this is not an easy question uh, to answer. And sometimes uh, the answer to those questions is, is a challenge to um, the history of the particular broadcaster. And uh, I, I think um, it, uh, we can see how international broadcasters often have to make really difficult choices uh, that bring uh, long-term commitments to particular languages, for example, uh, into question. And, and the final uh, you know, point I wanted to, 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 to make as I just sort of set up this uh, picture is to say that I think the future is very unsure for international broadcasting. Uh, international broadcasting is immensely relevant in some places uh, in the world, um, but uh, the uh, governments are increasingly skeptical as to why they should be funding it, and the publics uh, are skeptical as to why they should be funding it. And people are living differently now. Um, one of the issues that I hope will come out in discussion is that there is a, a tremendous mismatch between the languages, sorry, between the locations of audiences and the languages in which international broadcasters speak. 50% of the BBC's audience in any one language will not be living in the country associated with that language. So, you know, when they broadcast in, uh, in they used to broadcast in Hindi, um, and when they did that, 50% of the people who listened in Hindi were not listening within India, <coughs> and so on for um, multiple uh, languages. And this uh, separation of audience in a foreign language from um, particular um, geographical spaces uh, poses all sorts of problems. Anyway, that, that's what I wanted to say to uh, set things up. Um, 